Hello everybody, welcome to round number two. Sorry about the delayed round one there, but hopefully you enjoyed some of those rather unusual decks that Brythorn, our new GM, has brought. But with me for this round is Gia. Uh, Gia, have you had a chance to have a look at who we've got coming up? Um, I had the Excel sheet open just a sec. Let me pull it up. Yes, uh, Suni versus G1. And I have to admit, I've never heard of G1 before, but Suni, definitely a player that I'm a fan of. One of the many South Korean pro players who notably had a very great performance at Masters Tour Seoul last year. Um, back in the specialist format, bringing Combo Priest before it was really one of the most standard decks that everybody had their eyes on. Yeah, and he doesn't seem like he wants to play standard looking stuff because today he's got Librum Paladin, uh, Resurrect Priest, Control Shaman, and Control Warrior. And so just totally and utterly out of the meta on that one. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Jimon has got uh, the Stealth Rogue, Highlander Hunter, Egg Warrior, and obviously Zoo. I mean, you not? say obviously, but it still <laughs> seems like a bit of an off-the-wall pick for me, at least um, in comparison to Suni, though it might seem a little bit more obvious. And we are just going to start off with the Rogue, though, probably the most standard decks on either side. But uh, there seems to be an error with their match score. Jimon has not, in fact, already won the series. Otherwise, they would not be playing the series. Indeed. Um, I'm trying to get a hand on Suni's strategy here. He has banned Priest in the first round. Uh, I'm not sure what he banned here. I haven't seen that yet. But with Libran Paladin and Resurrect Priest, you'd be thinking he'd be going for Priest. But then he's got the Control Shaman, which I suspect just folds up sometimes. And yeah, of course, I... Control Warrior is actually just a normal deck. It does seem very unusual to be bringing Shaman. I feel like this type of um, lineup could still prey on aggressive decks, which if I'm asked what is the aggressive deck that comes to mind, you always say Demon Hunter, but because it's received so many nerfs, I wonder if Suni's yeah. conclusion is that it's still going to be brought by most people, perhaps fallen back upon just because there isn't that much time to prepare, but perhaps the control Shaman can still get some work done in this particular okay. matchup, though. I would say it's very difficult to outvalue the rogue. So taking a look at what are the tools actually available to Suni's Shaman, he's got Swamp Queen Hagatha at the very top end there oh, for man. some value generation. And in the middle, he's got the Fist of Raden, the legendary weapon from Shaman that says after you cast a spell, you summon a legendary minion of that cost. It's somewhat similar to Mediv from back in the day. And I'm thinking that he needs to make use of those very high impact cards to try and put some aggression on the rogue oh, to make sure that they can close okay, the sorry, game out Gia. before we rogue gets their infinite other, lackey train hopefully. going with the Galakron. Starting from here though, Suni is just off to a very slow start. A very reactive hand is very common for control shamans, but he is able to put down a spell this turn and get the value off Marsh Spawn on the following turn. Whereas for Jimon, a uh, Japanese player that I personally have not heard of, but I know that Japan as a region is very strong in APAC. He has uh, double miscreants to start off. No invokes quite yet, but at least um, some lackeys to possibly generate dragons. Yeah, I did a little bit, a very, very quick look through his Twitter before we saw him on air. And um, he's recently qualified for Montreal, so the next tour after this one. And he, was, he said he'd been struggling with decks at that point before winning the qualifier. And he'd been struggling with motivation a bit. Well, nothing boosts your motivation more than winning a 512-player tournament. And so I think he's feeling a bit more chipper for this one. Although he did mention already that he's getting a bit tired after watching for three hours. So presumably he won really quickly in the first round. Well, no excuses to be tired for people in this time zone. For once, we are given uh, the easier to be awake over here in Asia. And uh, Suni there with that Vilpara Scoundrel already had a choice to be made. He just ended up going for yet another removal spell in the Earthquake. There's already two natural copies in the deck, which makes me feel like maybe Suni's still looking towards a fatigue game plan, but I'm having a hard time seeing that come together against the value that Rogue can generate. Oh, yeah, it looks like I he's just start. on the kill em all strategy. He's just going to just absolutely try and wipe everything out. And like you say, that's just not how Rogue tends to function. But mm -hmm. if you bring this deck, you know why you've brought it. So we're going to have to yeah. let him teach us what the plan is here, I think. 
And with that pick of the Eye of the Storm, it really does seem like Suni is in it for the long haul and just planning to remove, which I would say if you look at the base deck list of a Galakron Rogue, seems like it's doable, but it's the fact that they can generate Togwaggle Scheme, they can generate Waxedred, they can generate so many ways to cheat out more value that it's a long, long way to get to the actual end of the deck. But for now, we should talk about what's going on in the immediate. Jumon has generated um, some tempo-heavy lackeys, none of the value generators, but still a good way to get grip of the board. Yeah, and anytime you get into this position, the whole question is, how much do I want to put out there? He knows that board after board is going to be wiped out, so to win the game, he needs to get that as efficient as possible, lose as little as possible, sort of tease out that removal from his opponent because right now this game is going to go a long long way before the rogue presumably gets some sort of edge to show for its trouble it's true and when we talk about wave after wave of removal we mentioned the double earthquakes but of course there's double hagatha scheme there's torrent in there two copies there's the lurker below which was buffed in the patch before this one and uh, there's also walking fountains to heal up later on so for Gmon, i really struggle to see whether the burst game plan can actually get there, but rather, as you mentioned, trying to eke out the maximum value from each and every single one of his cards, while also making sure that he doesn't fall prey to the small, meager developments that Suni has on board, is his game plan. <laughs> and just looking through, this is really rare for the last couple of the Masters Tours, there are seven different classes on the show here. So if it's feeling a little bit sort of disorientated, that's why. It's like we've got so much to oh. cover in the, this best to five. Banned card, Lorinda. Banned Whoa. card. Whoa. Now bouncing Transfer back. Spirit. Shadow step it. <laughs> oh, no. I joked well. about this before the tournament. It's like, hey, just, just play you know, like bouncing all of your decks just okay. in case you generate it. Yeah. For anyone who isn't aware, Transfer Student is a card that was not allowed to be submitted in deck lists. But of course you can't control whether it gets randomly generated and Jumon will not be in any trouble here but this is a card from the new expansion Skolomance Academy that has different effects depending on what board game board it is on and because we're in I think Stormwind it is basically a shielded minibot here two mana two two divine shield worth noting that it was created with that ability like some minions don't it's not a battle cry it's actually correct a feature of the minion there are some versions of Transfer Student which have Battlecry, like on the Uldum game boards. It has Battlecry add a spell to your hand, an Uldum spell. But this so is the board that we are on now. And so Spy no Mistress drawn for Jimon looks like he could rush that out if he wants to, to deal with the Marsh spawn, but not before getting the card draw value off of the Greyheart Sage. Yeah, and presumably he has to make a decision here. I think the pause, because you're not expecting to play against Control Shaman, mm. is just working out, do I want to draw cards? You probably do, mm. but you need to at least make that decision, because once it's done, you are now forced to kill your opponent, which is likely the plan, but again, you just want to be making sure you're doing the right thing with your deck. Interesting. He goes for the flick here. Of course, that has snowballing effects in that it removes the current Marsh Bond, the one in the deck, and uh, by extent removes another spell that Suni could have gotten. So that's very high value. And he even steps it back to possibly deal with the other high impact minions in the deck, like Walking Fountain. There aren't that many minions in the deck to begin with. So I can see that he holds on to Flick to make sure that if one of them comes down, Suni is immediately... Um, starved of further threats. And these are the sort of boards I was sort of trying to describe earlier. It's a board you just don't want to deal with, but it's five damage every turn, plus the dagger is six. Mm -hmm. And that's actually irritating enough that Suni will want to deal with it. But he won't want to deal with it because, look at it, it's nothing. It's just a whole collection of nothing. Which is funny because a lot of the time that's how Shaman used to approach a matchup versus Control Warrior, which is putting a bunch of tokens on board that they don't want to commit removal into. But if you leave them on board every single turn, the damage adds a little bit together and they're always threatening blood loss. So something somewhat similar with Jimon, but you bring up a great point that uh, at some point, Suni will have to start pulling the trigger on removal. And maybe with the play of Shield of Galakrond, which is 
far yeah. more damage than before. He will start finally committing, and the fist of Raden is drawn to make that more enticing. Yeah, just absolutely no way you can leave this lot up, even though it's still a hodgepodge of things. Uh, and this is where the game is going to kick into gear now with Sunni removing boards and Jimon just slowly but surely trying to keep the pressure on. So Sunni had an option there to try pre-equipping the Fist of Raden, but I don't think he thought it was worth the damage that was already on board just to try and get a 7 cost legendary. He could um, just follow up with Fist and a 5 cost spell next turn or the Hex, depending on what Jimon's next threat is. I and you were talking about, does Jimon actually want to draw cards? And the Kronks is there as probably the best mm. example of that conundrum, because not only is it drawing you further in your deck and the matchup might go to fatigue, it's losing the battle cry you might get off of Kronks after the Galakron is activated. So I doubt that that will be the I first won. priority on Jimon's mind. I am still, however, looking at drawing naturally with yeah. the Spy Mistress and Greyheart Sage. He's sort of run out of ways to keep the pressure on now. I don't think it's quite clear the way he's looking and considering that he didn't want to draw a lot of cards, but it's more important that you keep the pressure on, so you have to take the L on that particular battle to try and win the war in the long run. Before. Right. Still, in the end, decides to go for the Kronks. And even though I talked about the downsides of losing that battle cry, it is, however, just the most threatening minion he could have put on board immediately. But that walks perfectly into the well charged scheme from Sunni. Gets Anka the buried for his troubles. You know the names of the cards. This is something I've never, ever been able to master. It's a good job my, my job doesn't rely on this. <laughs> So Jim on getting the one mana cards now, not the zero. So another reason for Galakond not to be particularly hurried. Yeah, and in some ways, not getting the full four draws is beneficial. I, I struggle to say beneficial, but not entirely right. harmful to Jimon because there is a chance that he doesn't actually want to draw to the bottom of his deck immediately. He wants more time to press the hero power every single turn and get some more value. But now, Suni can drop that Eye of the Storm if he wants to, start taking back immense board control, and he's seen the Kronks, so it's going to be very difficult to deal with all of those um, storms. Oh, sorry, the Flick is still in hand, which he knows about, so that's yeah. not an option. Never mind. I was just getting there, but yeah. <laughs> um, but it's still there forever, and he knows that, and Flick will be used. Although, soon he's got a bit of a problem in that he just doesn't want anything to get Flicked. Flick is nasty when you don't play many minions, because mm. you are relying on those minions to do a lot of work. I feel like he could have taken the turn to maybe bait the flick out by playing Walking Fountain and then just Hero Power and then after he sees it, if it doesn't have the second Shadow Step on top of that, he could follow up with the Eye of the Storm and not to mention get a 10 cost Legendary alongside oh, it. Time. But these choices, another Hagatha scheme feels like it was more in line with his previous choices, but he actually goes for the Vivid Spores. Yeah, maybe he's feeling that now he's done the job like you were talking at the very start of the game about you, you can't remove everything forever maybe because Rogue just has too much value, especially with Galakon there now. The hero power returns so now it's the time to try and make a board. And that's easier said than done, but at least he has the full 10 mana to do that with now. And we'll draw into minions at least a little bit. Might be looking at the Waste Wardens and wondering, ah, oh, it just dealt with a 1-1 Lackey here. Why is this in the deck? Well, he also runs two copies of Plague of Murloc, so that's actually a combo to possibly clear out an entire board. That's actually really clever, and we might even see it work here. Plague of Murloc's particularly, excuse me, particularly good against Questings and Edwins and all that sort of nonsense anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it doesn't have to be comboed together. And in matchups against, say, Druid, you can play the Waste Warden without that combo. Hmm. I can't remember when I last yeah. saw Control Shaman. Probably the World Championships <laughs> last year. Yeah, I would agree. Or if you randomly spectated Wirer at any time of the day. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, sorry about that, Wyver. Yeah. Well, the walking fountain is made just a little bit awkward here because of the health on the questing explorer. That's fine, just get a Mookla. Wow. You'll be okay. Yeah. That's definitely the solution to this problem. And that's changed things around a lot. It's amazing that Mookla is obviously a, a rare role. There's, there's not many chance of getting it as a 3-drop, but when you do get it, it just swings games around. I don't know what the pool of three cost legendaries is, but can't be too many. Maybe there's not that many. You might be right. Anyway, the Swamp Queen was developed there, and yet another removal option for Suni. It just never stops. It just seems like it's going to be a dance of removing each other. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Dark Pharaoh to Khan means that Evlaki from here on out is going to be a threat. That's insane, Lorinda. <laughs> You wonder. What? He's actually got. Um... Sorry. <laughs> Completely changes the landscape of this game now. I was just gonna say we might not we might not have seen the last of it either because it is in Suni's uh, um, sorry in Jimon's zoo deck as well. <laughs> so we might see this happen twice yet. I mean, for Suni, now that he knows Jimon's hero power is essentially three mana, put a 4 4 on board, plus the lackey battle cry. He's got to find a way and to, the fact to that kill him. Jimon's only one card deeper in fatigue. I think Suni now has to change roles and start shifting into the aggressor somehow. I think he was already trying to put his foot on the pedal, but obviously there's there's not much gas there when the deck isn't designed to do that. But yeah, now he has to find a way to. To take a chance, and all the time, Jimon's just sat there with that flick. I mean, there's a clear with Walking Fountain, but it's not clean whatsoever. Yeah, none of this is fun now. I mean, I should say it's clean, but it doesn't leave him with any initiative, which is what Suni is trying to find from here on out. Because at the very least, Jimon can develop another 4 4. All of the invokes give him another 4 4. Yeah. Tend to. Not always does players like Casey exist, but you tend to know a player's really fancying their chance when they suddenly start playing 10 times quicker than normal. And Jimon just started until he, until this part of the turn, he was just firing everything off there. Mm. And now he's just that, wondering about overcommitting. Yeah, he said, "Let me take my four fours and put together how much I actually need to commit." He's seen one earthquake, but that earthquake was generated, so there are two natural ones left in the deck. But honestly, from Jimon's perspective, he can just continue generating threats every single turn that he just needs to make sure that there's no one turn where he doesn't put enough on board that Suni feels he doesn't have to remove and instead can counter-develop. But when we look at Suni's best counter-development, it is through a generated spell because all of the threatening minions are just walking fountains and the Swamp Queen, which have been played. And then if there is a generated spell, Flick Skyshiv can deal with Barrel Spirits, can deal with Eye of the Storm. So Jimon has essentially all of his bases covered. Yeah, it's, it's almost like Suni, maybe in absolute hindsight, could have just got that over with, get the flick to remove something earlier. Maybe just throw it out there and then get on with your life. Because it's just sitting there being a threat at the moment in Jimon's hand. But obviously he didn't know he was going to get into this trouble with all the lackeys being 4 fours. Because that's just ridiculous. Yeah, you can never expect that. Anyway, Suni does find a window to take back tempo somewhat. The Vivid Spores is actually very annoying for Jimon here. Yep, and that was planned for some time ago. I'm sure he didn't know exactly how he was going to use it, but... That was a long time ago he took that Vivid Spores. Five or six turns now. Interesting that he starts off with the faces there. I was looking at this potentially being a questing turn. But if he's not committing the questing, yeah. I would like to see him put down at least the Sky of a Tear and the Greyheart Sage, try to get some more card draw going. I like the way he makes his decisions quickly and then uses the other time to think. Some players try and think the whole turn in advance from the start, which that works to a degree. 
when there's random effects involved, you have to find out what the random effect is before thinking about the rest of your turn. So first decision is, am I questing? And then you have to slow down and think what you're doing after you see the generation. So he settles on removing the first half of the uh, generated Swamp Queen minion, which led me to think he would use the remaining mana to flick it away. But I guess that would, from his perspective, seem like an overcommittal onto the board. That's yet another 4-4, whereas he hasn't seen the earthquake, the natural earthquakes just yet. But so this I is a pretty good spot now start? for Suni. Can you remember, did he have both shadow steps at the start, or is there one to go? I, I realize you were soloing it, so maybe he didn't have the note. Uh, I guess both have been used. Yeah. I, I remember I seeing both in hand. Yeah. So when the flick is gone, it is gone. That's something. Fishing for the spell damage totem there doesn't get it. He's still going to end up with a Ooh. very relevant legendary. Yeah, oh Jim, my. I'm not happy to see that at all because that is the resources that Suni needs left in the decks. He is going to be able to get the prime fairly oh soon. Oh my god! <gasps> what is this? He gets to cast either another lightning storm or another vivid spores. And if it's vivid spores, it's just cubing your Zixors. <laughs> Yeah, and Suni's just going face. You were talking a moment okay, ago about, yeah. you know, he's going to look for a chance to reverse all this. Yeah, he's just oh. jamming face now. And he didn't need further Vivid Spores, let's be honest. He's got double Zixar Primes in the deck now. And yes, there's a flick, but it's either going to deal with Zixar Prime or it's going to deal with the Eye of the Storm. And Suni has turned this around now with some very incredible legendaries generated, but also a lot of patience as to how he uses his board clears. Yeah, a lot of forward planning and a lot of understanding of what he was trying to do. And that is That's one of the advantages sick. of bringing... I'm going to call this weird. I understand that people have seen this deck before, but nobody playtested against this. Nobody playtested against Control Shaman. Nobody playtested against Resurrect Priest. And nobody playtested against Libra and Paladin. Maybe they ran a couple of games of it themselves. Mm -hmm. And he has brought all of those decks. And that's going to put him in a good spot because people are going to make mistakes. I'm not saying Jim and made mistakes here. But over the course of a long, long day one, you don't want to play against these people who bring the weird stuff. Very true. Can't quite plan around it. And Jimon's choice of the Cobalt Spellkin was, I think, pretty heads up. If you're looking at a long-term value game plan, your gut reaction would be to go for Ysera. But I think he was fishing for something like Scheme there to try and um, pad his deck. Which makes sense in the long run, but the immediate problem is still staring at him now. That he does not have a good answer for this Vargoth, for the Swamp minion, or even the Waste Warden. And even though Suni doesn't have any burst damage available, the minion damage is piling up. Yeah, and it's looking like he's just going to get it done in two turns' time. Because Jimin's not built to remove this sort of board, not with the death battle effects as well. Yeah, he's not running any of the secret package, so it's not as simple as playing a stunner to sap back any of these minions. Just he now... can start picking apart the Vargoth at the very least. Yeah, all hands on deck. That like you say, you've got to pick apart something with a lot of spells in the deck. The Vargoth does seem like a, a sensible next target. And Jimin, just doing that pause again. It's just all so awkward, right? There's nothing that he can flick that also removes its death rattle. If he flicks the Vargoth, then it's very awkward trades with the minions. I guess he can go for it this way. Leave the 3 3 and the 5 5 on board. And I think he's got to take a chance and just load up some boards here. And you know that Suni has almost certainly got the removal, but that situation's not going to get any better. Yeah, he's hoping at least that if there's removal, it's symmetrical. So Suni would have to get rid of some of his own board in the process. But Suni is showing 10 damage on boards. Chumon, 15 health. Yeah, I think, I think he pretty much gave it up after the crazy turn. But he is looking for that, that route to victory. And again, you just have to hope they haven't got all their removal and they've drawn all their hexes and stuff. 
Well, on their AoE effects or something. And this 5-5 five five still has a 5-5 five five behind it. I think Suni can go for this. A partial clear. As long as he pushes all of the face all of the damage face. He just seems to be in a very good spot. Yeah, setting up that two turn lethal even with the five three getting cleared, like you say, with the one behind it. Little time. You play some of these, Gia. What's it like sitting around for, for three hours waiting? <laughs> I tend to take naps in between, which is very risky. I would not recommend it to anyone because there's a chance you don't wake up and you miss a round, which has definitely happened to me in some qualifiers. Although it's For a bit Suni, different. I, yeah. I was going to say, I wouldn't mind him going for a torrent there, a but because of the Vargoth, it does make it a little bit more awkward there. I think there's a lot of variables that both players have not seen in the way their playtesting has gone before. Yeah, this is just completely nutty. I mean, they've now just thrown cards on the board and they're seeing what yeah, happens with them. Um, but the difference now is that Jimon has to trade into Suni every time. So Suni doesn't even need to use that removal we've talked about all day. Because his removal is the threat of lethal every turn. It's hard so to see he, how Jimon can fight, right? Yeah, I feel like he has to pull the trigger on the flick now to remove the 5-5, otherwise he's just Not dead. If... I guess he's fishing more removal. It's absolutely insane how these lackeys just haven't got it done. Yeah, they're 4-4 four, four yeah. every time, remember, people? This is, this is pretty nutty. I mean... It's just insane to me how long he's held on to the flick, which if he knew about the Eye of the Storm, it makes sense. But he doesn't even know that's necessarily in hand. And the flick was the only way to survive on board that turn with the amount of mana he la had left. So it's just crazy to me that that was held on till the very end there. Yeah, I think sometimes in those games where you're caught off guard a little bit, you don't quite know where you're at. And you get an idea in your head, so his idea was, don't waste the flick. Mm. And you put that in one part of your brain. It's okay, I'm never wasting the flick. And then you just forget to update that, that plan. Right. I mean, it's so, tunnel vision, right? Definitely has happened to many people. And we could see that even if he, were, he had managed to survive that turn, the problem compounds onto the following turn because Suni is able to remove the board and perhaps still maintain some of, some of his minions. Whereas Jimon there, I feel, hardly had any of the value generating lackeys there. Although I do have to reevaluate my view of the matchup where I thought rogue value can get there at some point. But even with all of the lackeys with a plus three, plus three buff, it did not seem close. But as you can see here, Gia, the madness does not end with that <laughs> deck. Because now we've got the Librum deck. The deck that I think a lot of people feel is kind of close to working, but not really good enough. Yeah, it's always just kind of been on the edge of playable. That buff to Alder Attendant definitely with honor. made people pay more attention to it. But for me, whenever I've tried this deck, my main problem has been card draw. It just d did not seem consistent enough. And so I like that Suni's list is a bit different to what you usually see on ladder. It has Salhet's Pride in there, two copies, two copies of Loot Hoarder and two copies of Call to Adventure alongside the usual two copies of Hand of Adal to make sure that he's able to get to those Librum cheapening cards and the Librums himself more consistently. Yeah, and when, when the Paladin does its thing, it is the most frustrating deck to play against, like almost ever, even including Druid. Mm -hmm. it, on the occasions, it goes off and Lady Liadrin does her thing Ooh, and the Librums do their thing. Loot. It is just impossible to play against it. It's just yeah. that... Thankfully, it does not happen very often. This is a very, very straightforward deck in how it interacts with boards, and it has very little random generation in it. And so I wonder why I find it so frustrating, because generally, <laughs> I feel more frustrated against effects that I can't play around, and I don't know what to expect. But this deck seems to do the same thing every single time, as long as it draws cards, and yet you still kind of hate it, or 
That's my yeah. opinion, anyway. I, I, no, I, I agree. I'm not, I'm not a fan of losing at all in general, but losing to this particular deck I find quite frustrating. Maybe it's because of those caster people leading us to believe that it's not very good and we feel we shouldn't lose to it. <laughs> Well, it's worth noting that Sunni's version is not the pure Paladin version that does not run any neutral cards, uh, which is the other more prominent version I would say that you see on Ladder. Instead, he has his chief spells, more card draw, and one of Exotic Mount Seller to possibly go off when these Librams of Wisdom cost zero, and they almost have always eventually do because of all the cheapening effects. Yeah, you do have to make sure you. It's frustrating game plan wise because you have to make sure that you find time to go face as the opponent but you can't let things live for long either otherwise this silliness happens so it's a real balancing act i will say though that because this version is not the all paladin cards version there is uh no true silver champion or the four two that generates one it makes it a bit more difficult to remove single target minions like this questing adventure which is causing a huge headache for suni now the whole deck from suni's perspective i think is built to make sure that you never lose your grip of the early board in any case, he does have Librum of Justice now to get rid of the questing. Yeah, and as you say, getting that early board is huge. So you are tempted to continually um, deal with the opposing board if you're the rogue. But Sydney has got the board back, but only has like two chances to do this in the whole game. So if Jimon can just get the board twice more, he'll win the game. But looking at Sydney's hand. Lady Liadrin there, ready to go. Maybe Jimin just never gets it back. And Suni doesn't actually add any health to his pyro by doing this, <laughs> but he's committing those spells to make sure that Lady Liadrin gets the most value on her as possible when it comes down, possibly next turn, because Suni is look sorry, on the following turn, because Suni is looking at hero power, double hand of a doll, Libram, and just set up the train. And that's the annoying part. I think you've just nailed what it is that is frustrating. It's the hero powers. You kill all the minions, you've done your job, but you haven't because this happens out of nowhere. Oh. No minions. And the mount seller. Yeah, it's I a mean, one of in the deck, yeah. If this were a matchup where your opponent had ways to remove a death rattle minion without the death rattle going off. It would be kind of scary. Suni can't just all in on one minion like this and know that for sure he's going to get these Librams of Wisdom back. Mm -hmm. um, but there is no sap effect in this rogue. Not even the card sap, nor the Blackjack Stunner secret package. Yeah, it's the big so difference between playing on ladder. These, these lists. Sorry. And while he has been safe to commit all of the to one minion, he has to start worrying a little bit about his health total. He will be able to remove six damage from the board, but he knows that there's a wand in hand now. However, there's not really any other play than this and set up for quite a substantial mount seller to make even Druid eat their heart out on the following turn. Yeah, Druid. What are you? <laughs> Jim, like the look on his face, we've all been there. It's horrible to face when it happens to you. Um, and like you say, Druid would be jealous, and soon he just has to make a decision how to split these up. Yeah, I mean, he will overdraw in the following turn. I mean, he can commit one Librum right now, but if uh, Jimon decides to deal with the recruits, then the Librams fill up the hand anyway, so I feel that it's fine to just hold on. Or wait a oh. second. You could commit face. all of it and go face? So soon he believes there's no shadow step or that it wouldn't matter if there was. And he believes he's got two to turn lethal here, so Jimon's gonna to have to trade it to him. And this kills both minions in that world. Okay. I don't know about whether Taunt is respected here in the slightest. <laughs> I mean, he's seen both of its arrays, that's probably part of this system. Okay, that's a very good point. But yeah, I mean, Jimon is going to have to taunt to prevent this 
12 12 from going face another time. <laughs> or is he? Yeah, he's going to with a shadow step. <laughs> I feel like that was a quality play from Suni, though. Yeah, okay. Taunt instead. Sorry, Flick instead here. Does not want to give Suni all of the Librems back through the Death Rattle, so he does not remove the Recruit. I think it's very brave to not set up a Taunt here and just remove the other minion instead. It's such a game of... Like chicken here going on. Yeah. Like, double consecration almost clears, but doesn't quite. Oh, Nothing quite one works one here. One off. Play the hand and see where you get to and hope. Then you can't clear. Oh. Yeah, I mean, he needs double consecrate to deal with the rest of the board, right? He might end up trading. Yep. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Alright. Or he could say, you don't have two damage, you don't have Kobold <laughs> Lackey. Oh, man. DJ, okay. don't look. Respect. Yeah. Man, this is just not the way I thought the game would go, but I definitely see the logic from both sides. Uh, from Jimon especially, he's trying to make sure that Suni doesn't refill his hand with all of those Librems for free because then his problems are just repeated onto several minions and maybe distributed in a way that Jimon can't handle. He's also playing around Mount Seller this way. Yeah, and he's also just playing around value this way, right? The long-term value that he's going to lose. For Suni, though, it was so interesting that he decided to all-in those Librams on the turn he did instead of going off with a Mount Seller in the following turn. But now we're seeing double Kobold Lackey in hand for Jimon. He has this taunt to hide behind. He has an evolve to possibly get him another taunt. Yeah. Yeah, and Jimon's punished the play perfectly well here. Mm -hmm. And if we're looking at what Suni can actually do to remove minions without using minions of his own, it's very limited. It's just the other Librem of Hope, as far as I can see. Justice. Mm-hmm. And so he the Mount a... ends up getting wasted. Yeah. I mean, Suni has a draw for second Librem of Justice. But even if he gets that... Uh, okay. It's gonna be lethal if... Oh, it's not there though. This is such what a, a good weird match. game! <laughs> One all, it feels like we have about 17 crazy games of Hearthstone already. Yes! So, Gia, a question for you. You're going to enjoy this. Mm. What do you think the highest mm. win rate class is so far in this tournament? Oh my gosh. Is it Paladin? No, nope. it's no. Demon Hunter. <laughs> okay, <laughs> alright. You did the nice bait and switch on me there, the way your tone has yeah. it. I it's... thought it was going to be something completely off the wall. It's Demon Hunter, it always has been. But there you so have it. So what a piece there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would just want to go back and watch that game on replay. There were so many decision points there for Suni. I think particularly that one turn where he all in onto the recruit saying, you have to remove this to not die. And if you remove this, I get all of my Librams back for free. But I'm not sure if he took into account the possibility of just stalling it, in which case Jimon gives himself the time to set up the counter lethal, which is exactly what happened. Yeah, I got the impression that he felt that if he went for the slower version, he never won. Whether that's right or not, I don't know, but I think that's what he read. So he took the chance that there would be no way of stalling it out and went face and set up the two-turn lethal. And then Jimon, with his class, just went, no, I'm not going to panic here. I don't care about your 12-12. Just going to take my time, put things in the way, and eventually you'll have no Librams left. So I've neutralized what your deck does, and now I can just kill you at my leisure. Yeah, i just love to enter an alternate universe and see what that Mount Seller could have done there. But still, I see Suni's reasoning, and it is that kind of, I want to say, combo priest instinct in him to create a big guy and go all phase, never mind going wide. But we are going to move on now to yet another 
cla uh, archetype that I haven't seen in a long time, the Zoo Warlock from Jimon. Yeah, just casually playing Tekan and Zephyrus while you're at it. Why not? Just throw those in your Zoo deck, see what happens. And this is going to be very interesting because if Tekken comes down, which was thrown away there because the need for speed, then it's going to be interesting to see. I will say though that in APAC Grandmasters, when we were seeing Zoo prior to the Scrap Imp nerf, Possessi was bringing Tekken in his list alongside. I think there were also some Zephyrus players, not necessarily among the Japanese practice group, but. I think that Tekan is not something they'd be completely unfamiliar with. For Suni, though, he's got a pretty strong opening hand. The one mana, one three, always a welcome sight against Zoo. But now, Zoo are playing Flame Imp again because Demon Hunter has fallen off a little bit. The Alder Attendant doesn't line up the greatest against the Flame Imp, but it is, of course, Suni's best use of mana. It's going to start discounting the Librams, and then he can follow up with a coin three drop if he so chooses. It's going to be difficult, though, to just throw out the coin all willy-nilly when Consecrate is such an important board clear against these Zoo-type decks. Call to Adventure would give Suni his other Elder Attendant guaranteed, because those are the only one drops in the deck. But I wouldn't hate just him throwing out the holding on to that Consecrate for a little bit more flexibility. He's gonna go with the Salhet's Pride though. Which draw him into Loot Hoarders primarily. This is just a cycle mechanism similar to the Christology Loot Hoarder interact. Uh, sorry, Christology interaction um, with Novice Engineer back from the uh, Holy Wrath Paladin days. For Jimon, though, this gives him an opportunity to develop his magic carpet if he wants to. Looks like he's reaching for some other lackeys to develop, though. Kobold could have been huge here to prevent his own flame imp from dying. Very expensive dragon choice. It's not necessarily what Jimon wants to see. I think he would just take the evasive because it's the cheapest of these options. Useful things. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. But those dragon options are very annoying for Jimon, honestly, because it messes with his hand of Gul'dan with Nightshade Matron interaction. Nothing he could have done to, you know, just discover a cheaper dragon, though. So this zoo has the issue that it doesn't quite spam the board like we've seen previously, especially against this deck. Soon he able to keep pace early to some degree here so far at least. Jimon has found a window to develop his magic carpet safely though, but Suni has hardly taken any damage. He has started the card draw cycle and has this Amber Watcher to heal him up to a pretty respectable health total on the following turn. So this is looking like he would just develop two of the two drops here, not the pyro. That's going to be valuable later on. Yeah, can the other option is consecrate. To... Mm. Just fit it in. Maybe try and get the amber watcher down the turn after and take on Jimon with some of the bigger stuff in the deck and not try and go wide against the deck that's designed to go wide. It's true. Um, the play of two two cost minions would just be inviting Jimon to play more lackeys, trade into them, and push all the rest I to wonder. the face. So he doesn't actually give up any of his immediate board damage to trade with those. It's not really challenging anything when there's a carpet on board. So I can see the argument for Consecrate, but I don't know. I I'm kind of leaning towards trying to combo it off with the Pyro on a later turn. The fact that the second Attendant was buffed by a Call to Adventure, though, does make things a little bit more awkward for Jimon. Yeah, with lack of pressure coming in though, he is able to tap at will and trade at will thanks to the carpet at the moment. So I think soon he's going to need to find that board clear, otherwise he's just never going to get in front here. It's a bit difficult to say how the ideal trades would work here. Yo. But if he ends up using Soulfire anyway, 
it's not a problem for Jumon. I like that he doesn't commit the second carpet there, even though it looked like the best usage of his mana, because that's going to help him refill after the first Librum of Justice, which is very much on his mind now to try and play around. So yet again, this is a board that Consecrate removes most of the damage off of, but it's just so awkward for Suni, right? He um, is floating mana that way. I guess he could tack on the Blessing of Wisdom onto the carpet in that sense, but the other option of the Amber Watcher also just seems very, very vulnerable to any minions played off of the carpet. So we have to look at what Suni's long-term game plan is, which I think it's trying to get into the Librum of Hope and the Librum of Justice. And to give himself the most time, I like that he removes um, the most damage off the board. But here we see for Jimon, he's drawn the Hand of Gul'dan and already that annoying interaction with the expensive dragon he had to take is preventing him from just playing Nightshade Matron and getting the draw in that instance. But Librum of Hope now is available for Suni on the following turn. Absolutely huge. I think Suni can take this window to develop his Watcher and possibly tack down that Blessing of Wisdom. Okay, he's gonna hold on to it, knowing that preventing one carpet for, from attacking for one damage is not a very big deal. He wants to save it for a bigger threat later on or possibly even his own minions like the Mount Seller later on. There's a Scrap Imp for Jimon very, very late. I do think this is just looking like a Tekon turn. My and that means that lackeys from the second sinister deal and from evil geniuses in the future will be threats for Sunni as well. But he can get down that 8 8 taunt divine shield and the healing right now if he wants it. It does feel a little bit awkward to go for Librum of Hope at still a relatively expensive cost like this. But that's just me being, you know, very, very greedy when I play Librem Palette and I want to make sure I get all the discounts before the Librems come down. But if you look at it in a vacuum, it is still way overstated and very powerful for just seven mana. And Jimon, he can play his Zeraku now to free up Matron into hand of it. It is so slow here. There's 12 damage presented on the other side that it looks like he needs to go on the defensive. Only has one one drop to rush out with these carpets though. There's another one, but still not a great way to deal with an 8-8. I mean, he can't clear it, but it involves trading the entire board into that 8-8 taunt. You're just in time to see Jimon discard his Zoraku and neither of the hands of Kul'dan. <laughs> Ouch, indeed. It was necessary though. Had he not played the Nightshade Matron, it would have to be every single one of his minions into that 8-8. Now he's able to deal with both of the minions, but hardly has any refill left. Suni, at full health, has all the luxury about how he wants to play. So the Call to Adventure, I think, actually draws Blood Mage Thalnos now because he's played both of his only one drops and drawn pretty much all of the other two drops. Not a very big deal, though. I think it's fine for Suni to just develop a bit wider here. Even though it's not the most efficient stats for the mana cost, any amount of minions is going to be a pain for Jimon to have to deal with because both of the carpets have been used. There is a way to activate guns for cheaper now, and the lackeys have been buffed to 4 4 because of the Tukan. So it's going to have to be something really good for Jimon here. I'm thinking Rush lackeys, I'm thinking Cobalt lackeys. <laughs> He got it set up for 4-4 four, four, for 1 not to be enough every single time. I mean, they still get to rush though, which is a very big deal. Mm -hmm. The Murger Murgurgle with Divine Shield is very annoying, but the fact that Jimon can put a taunt in the way means that he can once again give Suni just the wall problem. You can't push all face 
if I put a ton in the way. But Suni has held on to the pyro. Libram of Hope combo. Libram of Just. Sorry, I don't know any of the names of the Libram. Yeah, they're just Libram, Libram of, of Thing. Combo. Yeah. It's like the lackeys. They're Shooty Lackey and Rush Lackey. No one knows what they're actually called. Just like the game boards. Oh, we've got to learn those game boards, Jim. But yeah, he has held on to this. <laughs> Going to get a lot out of this. Another way of just turning the game around like he did in game number two. Yes, One. indeed. Even though it would remove the Divine Shield from his Murloc, I don't think it is a very big deal. He can keep the train of card draw going. And he can even just face tank the second half of that Temple Enforcer. Oh. Okay, if he's committing the Librum of Wisdom, then of course he can just send his weapon to the face bed. And I think that's lights out for Jumon. He's not really had the most impactful lackeys. No, he didn't get the rush ones you were talking about and sort of used up a lot of resources in just getting back into the game then, what I saw. Wait, I forgot about the Zephyrus. Unfortunately for Jimon, though, both of the minions that he would want to steal because they have something attached, something of value attached to their death rattle, are above three attacks. So he can't just shadow madness them. Plenty of time for Suni here. Plenty of resources. Has only got to get one attack in, one good attack. So can plan for that. Twenty nine health to use if he needs it. Let me this is think. the most crucial turn for Suni now. Of course, Liadrin always looks good to get all of those effects doubled. Just playing one or two minions when your opponent is showing eight could possibly give Jimon a window to come back. His very last shot. So we're going to see Suni hold out just a little bit more here. Try to get card draw going for that second Librum Justice. For one big minion, or is he going to split this one? He might as well draw. This isn't going to matter in fatigue, at least for Suni. The order on that was a little bit sketchy. Mm. I don't think he quite knew what decision to make and then started running out of time and just did some things. That's true. That's very true. Og Merchant getting a value tree is very, very huge. Because Lady Liadrin, even though it generates so much value, it is not an immediate swing onto the board. None of those spells affect your opponent's minions. And so Suni needs to piece together some more spells to combo with this Pyromancer. He will get that from Liadrin, but not until she's died to give the Librams of Wisdom back into the hand. Right. And Jimon has gone very wide. That's going to be a lot of damage coming in, but there's still just removal options, or good enough removal options for Suni for at least two or three more turns. And some of Jimon's stuff's unplayable as well. Flame Imp's just terrifying right now. I mean, there's not burst in Suni's deck list. Mm -hmm. It's all coming from minions. There's no true silver champion even. So I wouldn't say it's unplayable for Jimon at 9 health. But he is just going to commit to that Scrap Imp instead. And he did generate himself an active Dragon Queen, Alex Straza. So that's refill, even if he sees the second Librum of Justice committed here. And it's not quite that, but it is going to be most of a board clear if Suni can just get his hands on one more spell. There's McGurgle. Oh, this is going to leave two four ones on the board. I'm looking at just committing the Librum of Wisdom, bonking the Nightshade Matron, and then going for Librum of Hope. Get his full heal, but it would immediately remove the Divine Shield from his minion. And that is awkward if there's two four ones left on board that just trades away the 8 8 immediately. It does, but how many minions? Obviously, the Alex Strauss is a big problem, but how much else does Jimon actually have left? I mean,. It's a good Suni point. Know, yeah. You know? yeah, he knows that there's a lackey, a dragon, and very small minions left at this point. 
So maybe he's just on the, okay, if you trade your two four ones into my 8-8, eight, eight, sure, it makes Hearthstone players cry to see that. But actually, as long as I don't get terribly unlucky on the Alex Straza, and that's not fine. Well, I mean, it's good. It allows him to deal with the pyro, which was previously threatening lethal. Yeah, it's not fine for Sunni, I mean. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's absolutely not fine for Sunni. Yeah. And now, Sunni is not behind. He has a lot of health, but initiative has been wrested away from him with only three cards left in Jumon's deck. Uh, the Mergurgle Prime could give him a board that is too difficult to answer, though. Yeah, answer that It summoned lot. another Mergurgle. Is that legal? The Prime summons Probably itself? Probably not. <laughs> And just throws out the Swampoos. It's like, well, you're playing Zoo. What are you going to do about this? Here's another minion. Mm -hmm. Just wear this. Deciding now where to put the plus one, plus one buff to make it most awkward for Jimon. I would assume the biggest minion. Because if Alex Straza trades into that, uh, then he could just possibly swing into it to remove if he wants to. But honestly, it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things because all of these Divine Shields are just too much for Jimon to deal with. I don't think he has Lackey Generators left to possibly give himself a Plague of Flames out or something like that. So many possibilities. To put less than 8 damage left on board to survive from his point of view and then just pray that the Ysera Unleashed gets him there? I mean, the Ysera will get him there if he has time. Yeah. Definitely, but time is not on his side. Yeah. There's just all. not a way to remove enough damage because of all the Divine Shields. He can get rid can of he... the 7-4, he can get rid of the Ooze, but there's still 8 on board. He's going to do what I thought he might do here, but I don't think it's like there's either one or zero dragons with Torm. He's going to zero tap. I just hope something mad happens, I think. Sure. So he's looking for taunts. He's looking for possibly rush, but there's not enough time to deal with that. And that is going to be game. Because there's only one board space left, and there's going to be fatigue happening. I don't know what's <laughs> happening anymore. <laughs> Deeply unpleasant is what's happening. And Sunni has won with the Paladin deck, and now he's on to Resurrect Priest, I believe. And In case Jumon you want some more crazy. Jimon has left the building, but the rope is still burning. The portals are still being drawn. <laughs> and he's going to take fatigue. <laughs> Oh, man. But other than that, it's all going well for you. <laughs> Correct. I'm wildly entertained, Lorinda. The series has been banger after banger. And it's not over yet. That is a Resurrect Priest left, so we have no idea. I mean, we've, we've all seen Resurrect Priest, but not since the days of the Albatross back up all back that time ago mm -hmm. and i think this is zoo and it's, it's actually egg warrior which today is like hey that's a, that's a deck that we don't see it's a normal <laughs> deck yes this series we have not seen very many normal decks if at all but you bring up resurrect priest from suny it is a close to the cube variant which would our people are calling it because it's running Grave Rune and Shadowy Figure to just copy and copy all of these annoying minions. And uh, it's got a bunch of taunts in it, which I feel is going to be kind of a nightmare for both Warrior and Zoo to deal with. Yeah, I feel like this is probably the central part of this lineup. This is the defining deck that says, just I beat you if you bring Priest, I beat you if you bring Aggro. Um, but only with this one deck, and that's why he's had to have this other convoluted mess to make this work. I feel like this was the, the deck he wanted to play the most, and he saved it till last. And the upside, I suppose, of playing this type of Priest as opposed to Galakron is that your removal options are a little bit more consistent because you have the room to play at least one Holy Nova, which is what Sunni is running, the one-off copy. He's not got any of the Invoke cards, but he has got a lot of stall in there. Uh, the notable removal, I would say, which could be to his detriment in this particular matchup is Sethic Veilweaver, in my opinion, because mm -hmm. that can tend to generate 
um, a must-remove minion, and also Apotheosis is not available. Gonna have to show its worth, though, up against everybody's favorite Scrap Imp early on. Card we don't obviously see that much anymore since it was nerfed. And it didn't seem like that huge a nerf at the time, but it completely killed the deck for a while. For a while, keyword. I feel like it's still a killed deck, but we will see. Hey, it's in a Masters Tour with a player who's qualified already for the next Masters Tour, who is 1-0. Oh. It's, okay. it's alive and kicking. But Argent Squire and Mage was also in a Masters Tour. Okay, fine. That deck won. I can't talk. Um... Well, exactly. we're, allowed, we're allowed to say what we think about decks before they win. But when they okay. win, we then have to eat our words and say, okay, Argent Squire Mage, played by Grandmaster, is winning. Therefore, we are wrong. All right. Like, that's just how it works. That's fair. I cannot talk smack about that. But for Jimon, he's hit a very, very good opening with that Scrap Imp, despite it having that one health nerf. I think for most of the minions, it's still going to push them to the three health mark or higher, which is very, very key against a Priest to try and escape the range of Holy Nova and the Breath of the Infinite. For the particular minions that Jimon has put on board, though, three out of the five still fall prey to Holy Nova. Yeah, that's a big deal, obviously. Clearing the entire board is nice and all that, but just clearing enough of it and actually just dealing with all the effects there first yeah. is all you need to do. You've got plenty of health, plenty of removal, just got to make sure you don't take one massive chunk. You can take some some big pokes. Very nice there from Suni. I definitely like that master spell there to make sure that the Scrap Imp itself can be caught in the Holy Nova on the following turn. Zephyrus played not as a Bloodfen Raptor. I cannot think of a 5-3 minion to compare this to for the life of me. But it's still going to be an annoyance, somewhat. But the fact that Zuni has picked up the second Holy Nova and already has had both penances in hand makes his next few turns so straightforward. Yeah. Um, but that's good. You know, he set this up this way by playing the previous turns in ways that... Um, I'd be pretty comfortable to say that a lot of people watching wouldn't have done to get to this now very straightforward spot. And I like that he didn't get greedy. He could have said, oh, the Zephyrus is damaged, so I don't actually have to use the Penance. It can get caught in the second Holy Nova next turn. But he would be taking five extra damage in the meantime, so I like that he commits the Penance here. However, Jumon has pretty good refill with that expired Merchant. He's gotten his second Scrap Imp now as well. I feel like it's always a priority to get online as soon as possible. Yeah, the second one presents some issues. You have to decide what you're going to do with it. Because if you don't get it online now, like you're saying, you're in trouble. But also, it has a very limited impact. So wasting the two mana sometimes is an issue. Obviously, against Priest, not so much. You don't mind buffing an, uh, an extra wave of minions for the future. And I like that Jumon commits basically the entire hand onto the board as well there. It might not seem a huge deal to protect this carpet, but really he was just trying to put more threats on the board after having seen a Holy Nova and still playing the best he could around that second Holy Nova with all the minions on board. So he put extra health on his high attack minion. He put Divine Shield on uh, the most threatening minion outside of that. And now with the second wave of cards drawn off of the Hand of Gul'dan, he can keep the refill going and hope that Suni doesn't have all the answers. Yeah, and I was just about to say he doesn't, but he does going on to turn 9. So only has one turn to survive, and there's plenty of things to throw in the wave till then. I mean, these are mass resurrects, though. They're hardly summoning anything. I don't know if Suni's played a minion this game. Yeah, that's a fair point, actually. Yeah. He spent the whole time just killing yeah. things. There are two Plague of Death in the deck, but that's not the 9 cost and all be all that's in hand for Suni at the moment. Suni needs to start drawing into um, his... I guess just the Kartoot is going to be enough of a problem for the next turn. That's the thing, the individual minions are also irritating for the Priest. It doesn't need that many? Nope, no good. Carry on. Not quite sure what you're implying there, but no, I just the thought that Vargoth might be superb, but it's actually just not so. We proceed as we were. 
like double shadow of death or something nice. Mm -hmm. Well, the shadowy figure is pretty nice here because Cartoon is both a death rattle and a reborn minion, so it can actually work, unlike with just, say, Bone Wraith. Back the second Jumon even pokes this board, it's just going to come back in droves on the next turn. Yeah, this is Vezovec Priest doing the thing that people love to see. And by people love to see, I mean nobody loves to see it apart from the person playing it. Very, very effective when it does get going, though. Designed literally to be aggro decks like this. We're unlucky for Jimon to walk into this lineup and... Honestly, looking at how this has worked out for Sunni, apart from maybe the Paladin, this lineup's looking like it may have just second-guessed everybody. He's gone for the people who are targeting the priest, and everybody's targeting the priest. Mm -hmm. He's targeting those people, so... I would not be surprised already to see Sunni very high up in the standings at the end of day two. Bold take for Libram Paladin and Control Shaman, but you know what? I've been converted. I like the lineup. It is such a brave choice. And I think the way that Suni has played, especially on that Libram Paladin, shows that he has put in the time to practice with these off-the-wall lineups. Indeed. And we have to be careful because he hasn't won this one yet. Oh, okay. He hadn't won this <laughs> one yet until I opened my mouth. But now he has. I mean, even with just three cartoons, this looks like death to me. Yep. Yeah, I was in safety first mode, but I don't even need that with the Soul Mirror backup. I mean, Jimon can deal with this board, but he can't deal with the next one, which obviously Jimon does not know that. In his mind, he's thinking about the Tekkon that he hasn't drawn yet, which is pretty unfortunate because he's played most of his Lackey generating cards already. But there's also a Zephyrus in there that he's thinking about, and he's hoping that the second Mass Resurrect isn't available and that the Priest Hand is just a pile of trash. At this point, though, it's very difficult for Priest to whiff completely. If they're not drawing Resurrects, they're drawing Plague of Death, Soul Mirror, Galakron, Katrina. Yeah, and also, while we've been talking, something that isn't obvious is Jimon's down to three cards. <laughs> True. <laughs> Soon he's on 17, Jimon's on three, and he's nearly just expended every resource in the deck. So normally you'd be saying, well, if I could just tease out some removal and, you know, the second Mazda Resurrect's out of the way, maybe I can not worry. He's not gaining health from this, so I'm not wasting resources doing that. But no, he's got three cards. Like, I mean, unlucky. If we're just talking about currency. Priest currency has appreciated so much with respect to Zoo because they've just stayed toe to toe with the Warlock this far with using hardly any cards. But unfortunately for Jimon, the Tekkon and the Zephyrus are towards the bottom. And now the Double Shadow Word Death does actually work. That's why I had the intake of breath some time ago. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't really matter. I don't think, I mean, I'm saying that. Well, be careful, but yeah, Soul Mirror just ends any questions, I think. After Twisted knowledge. What can we discover here, Lorinda? Uh, two Warlock cards. Yeah, not those. I was thinking, is there anything Jiraxis. that could be very game changing? Yes, Jiraxis is a big one, but second to con is not really what I'm thinking of. <laughs> no, not at all. I was thinking of Shadow Council, even. Just give him many Jiraxi. Okay. <laughs> I haven't seen Felgard in forever. Clearly haven't been playing the adventure, Serena. Oh. I must admit, no, there's, I haven't had chance to for the prep for this. I love the adventures content, but... I had to do the esports content first this time around. Oh, sorry, the Zephyrus has been played. I completely forgot it was played just as a 5-3, so it looks like it's Tekkon last card in the deck. Yeah, that doesn't help anything. He did mulligan it away. He could... Or was that the game before? Bane of Doom, his own minion, to try and summon a substantial demon. Yeah, I like it. 
Uh, I can't think of a demon that gets there though. From actually, <laughs> he's got lethal in his hand if Suni doesn't do anything next turn, right? Uh, and okay. the Soulfire uh, discards uh, the other card uh, that's in his deck. Okay, assuming that all of his minions get to connect phase, is what you're saying? Yeah. And the Soulfire doesn't discard anything other than the last card, which has now been played, so that's not going to work. Well, in that world, yes, he did have Lethal, <laughs> but Suni can do whatever he likes here. These are the hardest turns in Hearthstone. They're easy to get right, but you spend so long playing around every card that's ever been printed. Mm. He's just playing around a random Warlock card. The rest yeah. he knows about, I guess, not which lackey in particular, but he knows about those two soul fires. And it's completely and utterly locked up now. And I feel like he's beaten a strong opponent here. Obviously, in the Masters Tour, you're always playing strong opponents, but Jimon didn't do anything obviously silly. Just I line had up. a lot of questions about that first game when he didn't take the route to even survive against mm -hmm. the Shaman. I, I mean, very fair point is that he was probably dead that game anyway. But I do think that play could have been tightened up a little bit. However, I do really like Gmon's response to Suni's massive recruit in that one game. Yeah, I thought that was the sign that he's a quality player. He hasn't been on camera much before, so... Yeah, performing your absolute 100% best against this lineup as well is going to be very hard. So I thought he did himself credit, but I think that Suni is an early contender for top eight here, even though obviously long, long way to go. I can get behind that. I think the lineup is very unique, and to be able to bring something this um, off the wall, you have to be very, very confident. And it's not like these archetypes are unheard of. These are all decks that have been tried at some point. It's all uh, a matter of the timing of when you think the meta allows for this to actually snipe and be consistent enough. And maybe this is the one for Suni. All I can say is I'm really glad we got to see that series because it was just crazy games left and right. Yeah, and there's a lot of crazy Hearthstone going on out there. Something I didn't get to say at the very intro because we went straight into the match um, we're going to see a lot more of is how the Chinese players have been doing. I just want to have a very quick moment on that before we show you some other games from the round. Um, I did a quick eyeball, so I, did, I counted up quickly. There could be some mistakes here. But I think they were 15 and 6 in round 1. Wow. Um, and of the eight Chinese players in the Chinese playoffs to get to the World Championships, they're 6 and 2. That is correct. So they're destroying this tournament. Now they're playing you know, with the comfort of online in their own time zone for once because they have to play in our time zones a lot. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how, how China continues through this. They've only just finished their, their team league. So yes. we'll be able to see yeah, they're, all, they're all still playing a lot of competitive Hearthstone. And after this break, we're going to get a chance to see some of those players. So we'll see you soon.
Welcome back, everybody, to Martin Court Asia Pacific Online. We're here to bring you some of the extra matches from round two. Now that we've got that very exciting game, Suni taking a well-deserved win. I personally would be uh, very happy if we could see him qualify through to Asia Pacific Grand Masters. But Soto, for this upcoming game, I believe we're taking a little bit of a look over to a player from the Chinese region, a player that I'm always happy we get to see here in the Masters Tours, because obviously in Grand Masters, don't get to see quite enough of them, and uh, I think they bring something very interesting to the table whenever we see them. Yeah, they certainly do, and Trunks is a player with a decent amount of HCT Championship history, at least. Um, although, as you mentioned, we've kind of separated away from the Chinese scene a little bit with uh, with Grandmasters, um, although Lorinda is doing some excellent coverage of their, uh, their Gold Series events, trying to bring you as much coverage as possible, so we don't have another surprise world champion out of nowhere that you haven't seen <laughs> all year. Um, but yeah, Trunks is a quality player with a storied history. He's going to be taking on Thunder here. As you can see, the series is in uh, progress. We are just just wrapping up as much content as we can from uh, round two as the round is finishing out before we move on to round three. It looks like this series is sat at one and one at the moment. Uh, Warrior being banned away on both sides and the Druids and Demon Hunter picking up a win respectively. Yeah, pretty much the same archetypes left over for both of these players uh, as well. Uh, also appeared at the start. There with a rogue mirror that we have left. Uh, Secret Rogue uh, definitely appears to be the uh, the main version we're going for here. And even though I think you and I were in the same boat a while ago where we thought the stealth version was in a much better spot, I think now that we're seeing Demon Hunter take hit after hit, I uh, personally have moved over to the Secret Rogue train. Were you Team Stealth as well? I've been Team Stealth forever. I just Wait. like playing a one mana three one with Heck stealth. yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. High five, Derek. Virtual, <laughs> socially distanced high five. Yeah, you see this one drop sucks. I'm back on stealth train. <laughs> I take it all back. <laughs> yeah, Trunk's gonna skip here. We saw how important that card is, or how important, I should say, the lack of that card was in that last series and the Jir and Lorinda were covering where uh, the Control Shaman was just making Sticky Minions Death Rattle resummon effects, and without Blackjack Stunner, because it was Stealth Rogue on the other side, there was just no real removal options uh, for Rogue to be able to counteract that. So definitely one of the biggest tools that uh, Secret Rogue has available to them. Probably the biggest reason overall for me why you play the deck, even more so personally uh, than Hanar. And already we're seeing, uh, well, I guess with Edwin, the, the kind of two opposing game plans coming into play here, where I think uh, it's fair to say at the moment that Trunks kind of has the more, or his best game plan, I should say, is a board-focused one, where you're going for Miscreant at the start, trying to make a bunch of lackeys, and Edwin now, if possible, as well at the start, whereas Thunder has the more mid-to-late game-focused plan, which, uh, even though it's obviously been nerfed recently, Galakrond, I still think, is what you're moving towards in this matchup to make sure you're never running out of gas. Yeah, I would expect so. Um, I don't know whether going a little bit faster with uh, Togwaggle might be even more important in the matchup, because of course that wasn't touched sure. by the uh, the zero-cost card nerf, but certainly 
based on uh, what we're seeing from these hands, it does look like that Galakrond is pretty crucial. Thunder's still actually going for Spy Mistress in his Secret Rogue, which is something I was told not to do anymore, even though that's the list I was running before the most recent nerfs, because you're not expecting much Demon Hunter anymore, and it's just not in the top 30 cards in the deck, apparently. Have you been listening to Casey again, Derek? What have I told you about doing that? Uh, I've been listening to Meaty. It's it's even worse oh, than you okay, imagined. Okay. Oh, that, is, that is actually a step too far. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was messing around, but no, that's, that's serious <laughs> business. <laughs> so many. And Thunder, I think, is, you know, obviously he knows at this point that it is the dirty tricks. And I think with this kind of a hand, he can just quite happily not activate it for quite a few turns. El uh, Trunks has clearly got a fairly dead hand. It's not doing anything yeah. especially impactful. Uh, that changes now with the Miscreant. Now we might see a spell being played. But I really like his game plan of just curving out with minions instead of spells. Yep. Completely agree. Uh, Trunks here, not huge value off the Blackjack Stunner, but I think with how uh, slow and clunky his hand was, I think it was just for sure the right play. Just to drop the Stunner to combo the Miscreant, make sure that he has options now moving forward. He has tools for that Edwin if he wants to move towards that in future. And if the Shadow Jeweler Hanar comes back into play later on, then that's just a problem we're going to have to deal with then. Yeah, it, it's annoying in the matchup, but I think generally you're not put under much pressure at the start of the game. So you're always going to have plenty of resources. Uh, so, you know, having a Hanar generate a bunch of secrets is not that scary. They're almost always going to have some way to spend their mana. That Dirty Tricks, though, has now given Trunks a great deal more direction than he had previously. Now with those couple of lackeys in hand curving into that Togwaggle, potentially. He might just be able to go uh, one turn faster than Thunder is able to do with that Galakrond, as I was talking about earlier. That is true, and he's still got the power cards in his own deck of Galakrond and Kronks, which could be absolutely massive off the wand. But the problem is, he does kind of have to worry about just losing board before that yeah. happens. He's got powerful plays here, and obviously if he could hit Backstab or Shadow Step off the Ethereal Lackey, he's much more in it. Uh, but he has to be careful not to get too greedy with his game plan, because Rogues is still an incredibly powerful tempo class in the early game. Hmm. I am not excited by these options, Derek. Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking Sap because you technically have hard removal with Flick, but you want something cheaper for if they make a big Edwin slash questing. He went for the roll off the Pharaoh Cat, though, to discount the Vendetta. A few options that can do that, of course. See one of them in Thunder's Hand in the Restless Month. Good point, good point. The Brotherhood and it would have been actually insane if you had did it, so fair enough. Yep. Would have been able to remove the Mana Addict and drop this Edwin down as an 8-8 instead of a 6-6, which would have been a huge board swing, but now that Restless Mummy aforementioned is going to come in super clutch here. And while this is all very good and well for Thunder, it's uh, still not quite quick enough, I think, to stop Trunks from being able to get the Togwaggle in the next couple of turns. It's just uh, how he best goes about it before then, I suppose, which I think looks fairly clean with just shield on this turn. Yeah. Small decision point for Thunder, but he was originally looking like he was going to send the dagger uh, to clear up the last minion, but then diverted and used the Mana Addict instead, which oh, I do man. like because he is he has probably has a decent feeling there isn't a Seal Fate in hand, but he's still right. protecting himself uh, from top deck Seal Fate, and in this case, the top deck backstab that we see get drawn from Trunks. Yeah, and I actually, I love this deviation from Trunks. Instead of going for the Invoke on the Shield, which you would much rather do most of the time, he plays around Togwaggle. It's just a very clean play getting rid of both the lackeys. And so now, on average, I think Thunder's turn is um, mitigated quite drastically. Yes. He also generates maximum sticky minion, which if he needs to, if he's going to curve out into Togwaggle next turn, he's doing it by starting his turn with an Evolve Lackey based on the board that he has right now. The Brotherhood Shell Company. It's 
been a long time since I've even seen a mana addict receive a single buff from a spell. <laughs> it has been a while. Uh, the I can't even look at mana addict in Rogue. It's going to make me too reminiscent of the glory days <laughs> of the uh, stealth mana addict hitting them for 50 damage in a turn. I was going to say, have you even been around long enough to remember that deck? Dan? Have I been around long enough? How <laughs> dare you? I am a closed beta Hearthstone player. Okay. All right. Jeez. Wow. Emphasis on the close. I'm not a beta Hearthstone player. I'm an alpha Hearthstone player. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. Of course. That was never in question. <laughs> I actually remember I, when I was, I was checking my email every day to get the code. I was so desperate to get it. And then I realized two weeks afterwards that it had gone straight to my uh, junk folder instead. <laughs> it was not a good day. But it was also the best day of my life. A confusing time. Hmm. Meanwhile, the Togwaggle has come into play, but Thunder is massively ahead on tempo here, the way he can uh, clear this board up pretty efficiently, and this mana addict is <laughs> actually getting work done. This is full glory days. He's cold-blooding a mana addict. This is all oh. the nostalgia right now. It's all flooding back to me, and this is the problem that we were laying out Trunks could fall into. He had the value with yep. the Togwaggle, but he just needed the time to play it. And because of exactly Mana Addict coming down, it might be that little bit too slow. He needs something to clear up an additional <sighs> minion here. He has Secret and the Blackjack Stunner. Mm -hmm. with a but press. without a Shoot Lackey here to go alongside that, I don't think he gets <laughs> enough done. Okay, Rush Lackey works as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, Derek, we all saw your tweet. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yep. You just giggle to yourself. <laughs> Trust me, if I could cast in images, I would subtle. <laughs> well, at least you find yourself funny. That's the main thing, right? Yep, there is lots of things happening here. I think I'm I'm okay with all of them. He's clearing off the board. The yeah, and then Rush Lackey on the Blackjack Stunner, I would imagine, just to be able to take oh, care yeah. of Mana Addict. It's a big tempo swing, but he really does not have that much health to play with. Exactly, it's a two-turn, very easy lethal setup uh, for Thunder now. Obviously, with the one addendum of if Trunks can get his own Galakrond, then that is put by the wayside. But I think it's probably just the correct play anyway. Darkness I'm assuming that's not the final invoke. No, he's still two off. Okay. And now at 32, even with this already giant questing adventure in play, it doesn't look like Thunder's under any threat of counter lethal coming back the other way. Oh, if he died, it would be, now that's what I call Rogue 2014. <laughs> We've already seen a mad addict getting cold-blooded, then it's just a questing adventure OTK. <laughs> We're just bringing out the greatest hits. Somehow we'll find a way to conceal a gadget sand, just you wait. <laughs> Play Wonderwall. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in all seriousness, though, outside of uh, Spell Lackey into 15 Shadow Steps, uh, it's not happening. Yeah, I'm trying to think, like, Bluegill Warrior off this, then evolve into another Bluegill Warrior. <laughs> you can evolve, <laughs> evolve into Leroy? No, Leroy's Hall of Fame. Evolve into Reckless Rocketeer? There's something yeah. here. Just keep the thought process rolling. Yeah, yeah, we'll get there eventually. Of course, Trunks doesn't necessarily know that he's facing down lethal, as we can see with our almighty cast of vision, so he's probably just focused on making the uh, most impressive board state overall than he is than trying to invent ridiculous lethal outs. But we can see that Thunder does have the, uh, the Kronks available. Decimation is going to end the game. And yeah, Trunks was a little bit faster in terms of generating the power plays, but it was just good old-fashioned curve, just tempoing out early from Thunder that was able to get him over the line when no small part to that mana addict. And remember, there was a very key decision from Thunder where he chose to put one damage on that mana addict 
otherwise a backstab draw would have been able to clear it out alongside a dagger if uh, Trunks would have then chosen to. So that simple decision just to take one damage and uh, play around seal fate backstab type effects um, did mean that that mana addict ended up getting, what, 15 odd damage over the course of the game after that point, which is pretty insane. Yeah, very, very heads up spot there by Thunder. And uh, I think it really does just speak to the intricacy of the rogue mirror in general. It's definitely one of my favorite mirrors to play at the moment. Uh, because you can't just go full greed mode. You probably are keeping Galakron most of the time in the matchup anyway, but you've always got to be afraid of uh, dying to the tempo, as you also have to in this matchup up against the Highlander Hunter, which is why I'm thinking Backstab looks premium. The only question here for me is, are we brave enough to go for a questing prep hand to try and make a nice big board here, or do we uh, play it safe and look for the Pharaoh Cats and more sensible minions? Well, he's found the Pharaoh Cat, but honestly, I was pretty interested in the uh, questing prep, especially with mm. the insurance policy already of the backstab. It's not like you are just keeping a dead hand and praying. Um, it did seem like it had some potential to blow out the game early, but he does find the Pharaoh <laughs> Cat in the end, and uh, that is just about the worst possible minion for the situation. It is just about the worst possible minion, but just about the best possible minion here is being able to go backstab coin Edwin, clear off the board, get a 6-6 in play, and yep. just be an absolutely prime position there is the zephyrus response on the other side so thunder isn't just going to immediately roll over and die in this position but it is still going to be a huge tempo swing in favor of trunks even after this gets silenced so much so that it might even not get silenced yeah, and it's it's kind of worse than it initially appears, I think, uh, for Thunder here. Because uh, up against the Rogue, I feel like you really need to start pulling ahead in these early turns a lot of the time. Yeah. You, you can swing it back in the mid-game, obviously. There's very powerful mid-game tools uh, like Rotnest, CMAT sometimes, Dino Tamer Bran. Uh, but with none of those present available uh, for Thunder quite yet, I think he is looking to be in a pretty dire situation. Yeah, do like this decision though. Allows him to tempo swing just a little bit better mm. over the course of two turns, especially if Trunks does not have a very impressive follow-up. And chances are Trunks does not have a very impressive follow-up because Rogue doesn't really play vanilla three drops that they can just play and curve out in this scenario. Done. Interesting. I was looking fairly heavily there at just playing out the questing adventurer for another threat on the board. Uh, obviously, if they have Zephyrus, it can be cleared off with just a swing of the hammer, which, I mean, it could be anyway. But mm -hmm. it's uh, it's another thing in the way. It just makes it that little bit harder to effectively clear off the board. But yeah, I do like the line overall from Thunder, though. Invests six health, essentially, into creating a board swing, because as you were mentioning, like, just silencing that Edwin in the short term, it just doesn't really achieve anything. The remainder of the Edwin on board still deals with your Zephyrus, and Trunks is just free to develop anyway. So at least this way, Thunder invested some mana in getting his Stormhammer equipped, which is huge. And then he's able to create a full tempo swing, and now it's on Trunks' initiative to have to clear out minions. And Thunder might actually be able to start pushing some damage over the coming turns. Very possibly. And it's just a really awkward situation mm. now for Trunks because he does technically have a curve over the next few turns with just going for shield into, I don't know, probably Done. questing nonsense thereafter. But that's all very weak to what Hunter can do. You know, Dragon Bane, Hero Power, Rot Nest, or Siamat, as I was saying, you don't want to be playing up one minion at a time, or Hunter can very, very easily answer all of that. Yep. And this hand is just getting slower and slower from Trunks' perspective as well. Picks up more card draw with the Dirty Tricks. He has most of the most expensive cards in his deck, and that problem is exacerbated by the uh, Colossus of the Moon that he found off the Pharaoh Cat. Meanwhile, all of a sudden, Thunder just has a glut of options at his disposal. Scavenger's, Scavenger's Ingenuity plus the Dwarf plus Hero Power that turn seemed fine. This play also seems fine. Yeah, I mean, he just he reached very, very quickly for the Scavenger's Ingenuity first. I think yeah. a big part of him saving it is he's giving himself a decent chance of just hitting the 6-6 six, six, uh, Zixor Prime 
which yes. it's very likely the game will reach uh, the turn eight. And that would be a huge push onto the board. Okay, Derek. Where does this hero Believe. power go? Always to the where face. How go? dare you even ask? Where does it go, Derek? The game knows when you don't believe. It, it uh -huh. rewards the brave. See, this is what I was going to suggest, is you can actually just guarantee it by investing four of your health this way. This way you don't actually have to think too much. You just invest four more of your health and guarantee the five damage going face from the hero power anyway. Did you just say you don't have to think too much? Do you have any idea how little thinking my line involved? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You had the true hunter player line. I remember <laughs> And all of a sudden, from a 6-6 Edwin on turn two, Trunks is looking like this is kind of a zero outer for him. Yeah, I mean, you can get big tempo swings back with... Uh, I mean, I, I was going to say you can get tempo swings with like Blackjack Stunner or something next turn, but it's just he's just dead by that point anyway. It doesn't make any difference, really. Right. Imagine there being a next turn, Derek. Mm, yeah, exactly. Dragon's Horde into a miracle? What is the miracle in that scenario? I don't think there even is one, right? Yeah, I'm not coming up with anything Nazari, but they've buffed it to zero mana. <laughs> and you just didn't read the patch notes. So how much damage oh. is this? 6, 8, 9, 12, 14, 17 with Unleash the Hounds? Yeah, I'm counting. It's good to me. Well over lethal here uh, yep. for Thunder. And the Rogue just looking a little bit clunky there for for Trunks. Unable to get the, uh, the tempo early on. I mean, you know, being uh, off of the... Uh, uh, not having the coin with the Miscreant in the first game and then unable to get any of that early development with Miscreants and Lackeys in the second game. It is very tough. Yeah, I mean, you say it looked a little bit clunky to be, but, but to be fair to Trunks, like reading down his deck list from the top, Galakrond, Kronks, High Sparrow, Togwaggle, Flick, Shield of Galakrond times two. Sure. So that's what, six cards? And he had four of them in his in his opening hand or near to opening hand in that matchup. So when that happens, it was always going to be a kind of a binary situation yeah. where he was blessed with the Edwin. And if the Edwin worked, he was probably going to be okay. And that, you know, carry him through to the late game value. If it didn't, he just wasn't going to be able to catch up again on board. And I think, again, Thunder made a pivotal decision not to panic with the Edwin Van Cleef. Just let it do its thing for one turn. Create a bigger tempo swing. Invest in that Stormhammer, which he put to good use over the rest of the game. So, yeah, good stuff from Thunder so far. Very, very clever line. And it does mean, sadly, of course, that Trunks will be dropping down to one and one here in round two of the round robin. But fear not, there is still plenty of time for these players to turn things around. And now uh, with VK Diana, we're taking another look at one of the uh, Chinese players here. And of course, Zuhex on the other side, a player who I really, I think, got my first good look at, at uh, Masters, t uh, sorry, at the Oslo Tour Stop. Uh, a couple of years ago yes, now, right. time yep. has flown by, uh, mm -hmm. and he's a really nice guy. Uh, very much enjoyed hanging out with him there, and I think is definitely one of the the players that has flown under the radar, as the Spanish scene overall seems to have done in the past couple of years. Yeah, I think since what Akawanda really yeah. stepped away from from high level competition, I think there haven't been too many uh, Spanish players picking up that mantle in this in his stead. Yeah, I'd agree with you there. Zuhex definitely feels like the, the premier Spanish player right now. And off to a great start. If he can take the win now, he will be in a very good spot to try and get over to day two with a positive record. Yeah, I like this decision already. Some players might have been tempted just to take the corrosive breath there and remain, quote, ahead on board. But I think over the course of two turns, you are more ahead on board if you just pull a three-drop beast off that scavenger's yep. ingenuity instead. Diet presented with a kind of tough decision here with the Primordial Drake because it's... In, in the best case scenario, it's just going to trade with whatever your opponent plays because it's either the Zixor, uh, Zixor or Diving Griffin, at which point they just smash into each other. But if he doesn't go for it, then he's kind of falling behind on board. Mm. So is it worth just coining out and accepting 
even is the best you're going to get. Yeah, I kind of like it, honestly, because otherwise the three-drop beast that they've likely drawn from the Scavenger's Ingenuity just becomes a problem that you have right. to solve instead, right? And I, I don't want to be in that position. Like, let Zuhex just rush his guy into your guy, and then you can just continue to develop next turn, potentially. But I guess looking at the, the state of his hand, he didn't really have an option to fill, to follow it up. If he did mm. coin out Primordial, he'd have to find something off the Primordial or top deck something to be able to clear it out. And this way, in the scenario where it was exactly Diving Griffin, he had the Corrosive Breath to take care of it anyway. It's actually yeah. on reflection. I think I'm okay with this line. Me too. Uh, you also have to add into the fact that now he has Coin Rotness Drake, which in the case yes. that it was Zixor, there's a pretty good chance that you can snipe it out that way. Uh, so I, I think it was uh, probably the correct way to go. It's just an interesting dynamic where you take like a bad quote unquote line as the best outcome you're going to get. But I think it's easy. Uh, the more optimistic play and he will be rewarded for it. Meanwhile, Zuhex taps his temple and says you can't rot nest my minion if it's dormant. <laughs> However, yeah. if it's dormant, it can't attack into your Edwin. Into your 6-6 six, six Edwin? Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Starts smashing his own head, he's so clever. <laughs> Boring a hole into his temple. <laughs> Well, variety of I'm... ways that Zuhex can respond to this, though. Yeah. I mean, it, it, is it worth going any deeper than just Battle Mage Zephyrus death? I don't think so. I am just considering the various options of, yeah, this is the thing that I was looking at as the alternative. You develop more and take zero mana silence instead if it's offered. Yeah. I mean, you end up with the exact same board with uh, a 2-2, two -two, if, if you were to take the trade into the Edwin. Um, but I suppose you have a little bit more of a, a choice, and you have the Zixor played already, which gives you a slightly higher chance of drawing the Prime as well in the next few turns. Right. I'd sort of kind of mentally ruled this out as overthinking it, because as you say, so in the other world, you have a 2-2 two -two in play instead of this 2-1, and your opponent doesn't have a 2-2, two -two, they have a 3-2 instead. Right. This is only mar I guess this is marginally better um, at the cost of not having a weaker card in your hand in the Battle Mage yes. as opposed to the Zixor but as you correctly argue, getting this Zixor out into play and dead as quickly as possible is actually kind of beneficial for Zuhex. So I think the two lines are actually pretty close. Obviously. Yeah, it's very close. Diana decides he's a play it before you trade gamer for absolutely <laughs> no difference at all. It was almost certainly the worst of the two options for Zuhex, especially yes. with this evasive worm wanting to be played on curve this turn. Yes, yes, yes. But you're still just playing it, right? Yep. You've got to play your big guy. There's no point in weaving in hero powers, or I should say it's not worth mm. weaving in the hero powers yet. Yeah, I think Battle Mage Bone Chewer Go is just too weak in the scenario. I like that he takes his time, thinks about it though. Like, obviously, playing a rush minion for zero value means that you just played a pretty inefficient minion. But honestly, 5 3 untargetable Divine Shield just isn't actually that bad on an empty board against a Hunter. Yeah, it's fine. They really struggle to deal that uh, one damage, obviously, especially with the fact that their spells can't even target it. Yeah. Now you can see already the flexibility that Zuhex gains just by spending all his mana on the previous turn. He can now follow that up by also spending all of his mana on this turn, which would not have necessarily been the case if he'd have gone with the other line. Mm, so how are we best working through this? Unleash looks pretty premium on this turn. I think that saving the uh, potential for a Dragonbane later does make sense. Yeah, kill command too clean on that Bone Wraith. Does just come up a little bit short of being able to take care of the bigger minion, but can at least pop off that Divine Shield and clear out everything else. And Zuhex Ooh. needed a big draw, and that is... I guess that qualifies. Deceptively large, I think. Yes. 
Just looking at the top end of the respective decks, we can see Dragon Queen Alexstrasza in hand for uh, Diana, so he is certainly playing it. However, Zuhex has chosen to cut the Dragon Queen Alexstrasza, which is something I was talking about really? with Raven earlier. Yeah, f a few people are doing this. Wow. In, Hi in Highlander Hunter specifically, it does feel like the one deck where the nerf really hurts. Like, don't get me wrong, yeah. it hurts across the board, but Highlander Hunter is the curb out until nine, and then I play Dragon Queen Alexstrasza on nine, and then, you know, just use that as the final push to end the game. So I think this is the deck that suffers the most. Um, personally, I would still be including Dragon Queen Alexstrasza, but I can understand yeah. the thinking of the players that chose to cut it. I mean, it was very close to being very bad here for Diana. If he hadn't been able to uh, lock down the board on this turn, he yep. would have just been dead before he'd been able to play it. But now, however, it's looking premium. A completely dead draw for Zuhex. Uh, he's instead having to rely entirely on hoping this Nagrand Slam can get the job done <laughs> for him next turn. Yeah, it's going to be, assuming it is just going to be Dragon Queen go, three of the attacks will have to go face with three possible targets. Um, but Diana, honestly, I was going to say, Diana might yeah. just have a pretty clear read on what the situation is here. And the fact that Zuhax just had a nine mana pass, which means just adding additional targets to the board to reduce the opportunity for uh, Nagrand Slam to just go face multiple times is probably pretty smart in this scenario. Yeah, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if Diana had a perfect read on what Zuhex's hand here, because there really aren't many combinations of two cards that you wouldn't just play no. out Agreed. on that turn. I think one card he might have been considering there, and with the Fairy Dragon only coming down at the last moment, was Unleash the Hounds, which is a possible card that Zuhex might have been holding on to for lethal. Uh, sure. But even then, he still wouldn't have had lethal with the Fairy Dragon being played, so absolutely the correct decision. Tantalizingly close now as well uh, for Zuhex on the following turn with Desert Spear hero power, uh, if he's able to survive until that point, of course. As uh, Diana could just take the 50-50 straight up right now to move up 2 and 0 oh at the start of the Swiss. Yeah, and the good news is even if the 50-50 whiffs, that means that the board is clear and Zuhex is going to be on a top deck to get himself out of this situation. <laughs> However, Dragonbane always knows where the place is and that is going to be Diana going up to a 2-0 and zero record. Zuhex falling back to 1-1. One and one. And Highlander Hunter does seem like it's going to be the uh, story of the tournament, Derek. It's the most represented deck. It's the deck that we are uh, seeing in the majority of series because it doesn't seem to be facing bans either. What do you yeah. think about that? Uh, well, I've talked to a couple of the players um, about how it's been facing out in terms of bans. Uh, there have been a few players, I think, who have been bringing Mage and banning Hunter, which makes some amount of sense to me because I think you can try and uh, go for a slightly stronger target on like uh, maybe Druid or the Warrior if you like those matchups. But to be perfectly honest, Hunter, to me, does not feel like the best deck at the moment. And if your strategy revolves around banning it because you bring decks that are really weak to it, instead, I think uh, I prefer just bringing slightly stronger decks and banning out the stronger decks in a warrior or perhaps druid for the most part but i fully agree i think that it was a, a great inclusion in most of these players lineups yeah it certainly has seemed pretty impressive so far really hasn't seemed to struggle to get a win in too many series up until this point but heard lorinda pointing out earlier that actually based on the the stats in the bracket demon hunter is once right. again <laughs> the highest win rate class in the tournament absolutely impossible to kill that deck apparently it just keeps on coming back and perhaps this would be the first time we could argue maybe demon hunters even underrepresented in this tournament very possibly i mean it's a class that just starts with gen gray main's hero power effect basically <laughs> is the way i've had it described that's always going to be pretty good uh, in hearthstone when the rest of them have two mana but i believe that does mean that we are all wrapped up for our second uh, second uh, round robin here. We're going to go into our third round of round robin after this short break. So make sure you don't go anywhere. We're going to start getting a really good idea of who is likely to go through today.